Welcome to another episode of CBT Talks. I'm Joel. I'm Jake. And today, Jake, we're going to unpack just a few aspects of the Conquest era. Awesome. An amazing era filled with excitement, blood, gore, disappointment, and victory. Are you ready? Ready. Well, the conquest era, just like every other period of time, gives us great insight into who God is because he is always revealing himself. He is acting in human history, giving us instructions, promises, and prohibitions. And then there's a passage of time as God accomplishes his will. And as we get to the conquest era... Well, well, hold, hold on. What if people don't know when the conquest era is what you know what would be helpful is if maybe there was some kind of um, material that provided an overview of all the eras so that as they're listening uh, to the podcast or reading through their bible they can quickly go back and reference and just figure out like what are some of the main things happening with each era if only there was some kind of material that cbt produced you know that provided some kind of overview of the 14 eras. Is there is there something like that? that I'm so glad you mentioned that because I happen to have a copy of the 14 era booklet and this is authored by Ava May. It's the 14 era story of the Bible. It's a really, really quick overview of the Bible, giving you the basic high points, explaining each era of the 14 era framework. Mm-hmm. And as we get to the, the conquest era, of course, we know that God has created all things. He's yep. revealed himself through creation. He's, he's given the picture of the promise and redemption. They've passed that on. Mm-hmm. He destroys the whole earth. He, he, he calls Abram out of a family of idol worshipers, promises to establish a nation. Mm-hmm. Abraham passes these promises on through the patriarch era to his sons. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, so Abraham, then Isaac, then Jacob. Jacob, Joseph, Jacob's son, ends up being sold into slavery to Egypt, and Mm -hmm. and that's how Abraham's descendants get to Egypt, where they flourish. They become millions of people, become enslaved. God Mm -hmm. raises up a redeemer to to redeem his people out of their slavery Mm -hmm. to Egypt and and bring them into the promised land land, the land yeah. God promised Abraham. And so Moses in the Exodus and law era is the, the, the steward of God's word that he raises up to do that. Yeah. God brings them to Mount Sinai. He enters into covenant with them through the giving of the law. And then we, we see as, as the first generation of Israelites completely reject God's covenant right off the bat, they refuse to go into the promised land mm-hmm. because there are big people there. Yeah. There's a whole bunch of Hulk Hogan and mm-hmm. and the uh, yeah. Dwayne Johnsons over yeah. there to fight. And I'm just going to be honest with you: if if I'm lining up against Dwayne Johnson, I'm you know I'm pretty scared too. Yeah, you know. So they reject God's promise. A whole first generation goes away, and and so God prepares this second generation of Hebrews Mm -hmm. to enter into the promised land. Moses' successor in leadership is Joshua, a man who has been groomed Mm -hmm. really, really right from the get-go. But Joshua is a man who never left Moses' side. When Moses would go into the tent of meeting to to speak face-to-face with God, Joshua never would leave. When Moses would leave the tent of of meeting to go do whatever he did after he spoke with the Lord, Joshua wouldn't leave the tent of meeting. Joshua was dedicated yep. to God's word. And so Joshua now is going to lead the people into the promised land. And this begins yes. the conquest era. Yep. And I think the conquest era is uh, really like a make or break era if you're reading through the Ooh. Bible. I, I really do think that because, you know, especially reading through the Bible the first time. Um, it's pretty easy to get through the first few eras. Uh, it, it's exciting, and you're, you're familiar with the stories, and, and each era isn't, isn't that long. Then when you get to the Exodus era, you have a long period of reading over the law. And even though that is difficult, um, it, especially if it's your first time reading, you haven't really 
been disciplined in reading your Bible every day. Uh, but some of the laws are so interesting uh, that it's still it's still engaging. We, when right. you get to the conquest era, we're now back into this historical narrative. And there's going to be people, and there's going to be dates, and there's going to be places. And if you are not disciplined to try and follow this story, it becomes easy, starting from this point throughout really the rest of the Old Testament, to lose your place and lose track of what exactly is happening, of how much time has passed, at, at where they are. And that's why I think the resources that CBD offers, not including not only the booklet, but also uh, like the weekly review questions and the podcasts and, and articles, like all those things really help illustrate uh, and provide a foundation for us to, to stick on what exactly is happening in this historical narrative. Because once you enter the conquest era, we have a fairly full history of all of Israel uh, all the way uh, until you get to the silent era. Like, you have a, a full description of what's going on. So if you lose track of, of what's going on in that timeline, uh, it, it, it's going to mess you up. <laughs> well, and it not only does the timeline get a little, little complicated, mm -hmm. but also people begin to struggle with the character of God in this era. This is really the era, if, if you're ever discipling new believers, or someone who is not yet submitted to Jesus by faith, and they're yeah. just they're learning who God is. Boy, they get to the conquest era, and this is where they really sometimes begin to struggle with who yeah. God is. Yep. Yeah. And you know, I think if they begin to struggle with who God is, it it usually is because they have been told a lie about God. They've they have a picture. It's of It's always God. because yeah. they've been told, told a lie about yeah. God. Yep. Yeah. It's because they they have this picture of God in their mind that. That God is just like a, a really kind grandpa that just wants to give you gifts. I, I like to call this the Santa Claus syndrome. Of, sometimes we pretend that God is Santa Claus. We're like, yeah, you know, he, he sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows you in bad or good. And if you're good, he'll give you stuff. Like that's that very cartoonish version of God that we have. And so when you're reading the conquest era, you're like, that's not who God is. Mm. And so... If, even without realizing it, you have that kindly Grandpa Santa Claus picture of God in your head, and then you see God executing judgment, and you're like, wait a minute. My, who who I thought God was and who the Bible reveal God, God, is revealing God to be, um, they they do not match. And so, yeah, I think it, it causes struggle. It causes people to reconcile, but ultimately it provides a a richer, deeper understanding of the character of God, because God is not uh, just a, a kindly grandpa. God is creator, and he is judge, and he is sovereign. And if we don't fully understand those truths of his character, um, we're never going to be able to have as deep of a relationship with him as, as we could. Yeah, and if you've never found a, a, or prepared a personal answer to questions like, why would God command his people to destroy women and children yeah. in the land of Canaan? Why would God do that? If you don't have a good answer for that, boy, it is coming up. Before we get to yeah. that issue, though, I want to just point out right at the beginning of the conquest era, there's this incredible moment where Joshua, I believe, bows the knee to Jesus mm -hmm. in in person. And it, 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 he's called the, the commander of the armies of the, the Lord. Lord. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, it's, it's really interesting because you, you ask the question, who is this? Well, it, it, the answer really solidifies when you get to Luke mm -hmm. and the story of the birth of Jesus. And the angels appear to the shepherds. Mm -hmm. And it, it says that those angels are the heavenly host. Yep. That word host is it's army, the mm -hmm. heavenly armies. Yep. Here in Joshua, to begin the conquest era, because the people are commanded to carry out God's judgment on the Canaanites, yep. before they carry out that judgment, Joshua has to have a moment with the commander of the armies of the Lord. Of the Lord. Mm -hmm. That's Jesus. And so you have the commander of the armies of Israel 
yep. submitting to the commander of the armies of the yep. Lord, who is Jesus. So. And, and in case you didn't uh, catch last week's episode, uh, this is why all these things tie together, talking about that bet of that Jesus being the firstborn uh, son and him having sovereignty and dominion in a household if they were to go to war. Who was in charge of leading that household in war, leading the armies? The firstborn son, the head of the household, was the one in charge of leading. So, again, that's uh, another proof of why we believe the the commander of the Lord's armies, uh, the Lord of Lords, uh, the King of Kings, is Jesus Christ. And we also see that picture in Revelation, too, of Jesus leading the armies of the Lord. And so, yeah. yes, right at the beginning, uh, at the conquest era, before they embark on the conquest of the Holy Land, where uh, the, the promised land where Israel will form and make this nation, uh, Joshua has to bow the knee to Jesus because ultimately, as, as we see throughout the conquest era, it's not the might of Israel's army that is able to win the day. It is the Lord's provision and sovereignty mm -hmm. which allows them to conquer the Holy Land. Yeah, and God actually told Moses and, and the people through the law that he would send his hornet ahead of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and so you have, you have Jesus, the, the hornet, the mm -hmm. commander of the armies of the Lord, who will go ahead of them to yeah. fight. So the armies of the Lord mm -hmm. are going to fight the battle, yeah. but the armies of Israel are going to participate in these battles. Yeah. So when you jump all the way back to Luke and you have the, the, the armies of the, of the Lord, the heavenly host mm -hmm. who are singing the announcement of the birth of their commander yeah. in, in flesh, it, it is an amazing, uh, amazing picture that really begins right here mm -hmm. in the conquest era. We like to think of Jesus as a baby in a manger. We like mm -hmm. to think of, of Jesus as a, a white guy with long, flowing, brown, curly hair, yeah. you know, kind of like a, you know, a, a Fabio version, just with brown yeah, yeah. hair. We like to think of Jesus that way with, with smooth skin. And yeah. man, he is a bad to the bone commander of the most awesome army that is yep. in existence, an undefeatable army. Mm -hmm. And he is called by God the Father, the Hornet. Yeah. That is a bad to the bone nickname. <laughs> I mean I'm just yeah. saying if you were to if 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 you were to call me the Hornet Mm -hmm. Man, I would I would embrace that. I tell you, if you if you want to uh, if you want to test someone's uh, Bible knowledge, just be like you know Jesus is the hornet of God, and just see how they react. Oh, because you know ninety nine people would be like, "What are you talking about?" But there there's going to be one person who's read through the Bible, maybe even chronologically, and is like, "Yes, he is," uh, and they'll be able to tie it back to that story. But. Uh, that's just, it's a cool nickname, you're right. I wish I had that nickname. Well, I mean, the, the it, if your nickname is the Hornet, you, I mean, no, no bones about it, you're, you're bad to the bone. So uh -huh. here's the deal. It, this picture where the, the commander of the armies of Israel mm -hmm. must submit to the commander of the armies of the Lord and receive instruction from him. God mm -hmm. tells Joshua, don't step to the left or the right mm -hmm. of, God, of God's word. Be strong and courageous. And, and so... Uh, that is all in, in support or connection to this amazing command that they are to go into this land and completely wipe out mm -hmm. seven nations of the land yep. of Canaan. Why in the world would God command these, these mm -hmm. people well, to do such a thing? I do want to say, even before they go uh, to start that work, though, there's one other really important thing I, I want to touch on that that uh, they had to do before they entered the Holy Land. And this just shows why it's so important, not only to read your Bible, but to read your whole Bible before they went to conquer the land. There was a reading of the law mm. in front of everyone. Now, mm. this this doesn't mean that, that Joshua and leaders were like, hey, everyone read your own personal copy <laughs> of Scripture at your own you know point in time, maybe five minutes a day. No, this is... A mostly illiterate people, they are having, and they only. There's no printing press. They they have a few scrolls. They're having to read, um, pronouncing like you know, uh, 
outside, like amphitheater style, uh, pronouncing the letter of the law. And so for hours and hours and hours, someone is reading out the law and all the people are gathered and in silence in order to hear the reading of the law because they're oral learners. And so that, uh, that love and that submission to God's word is powerful. I mean, you know, sometimes in church, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll say, you know, please stand for the reading of God's word. And, you know, if they read more than a chapter, people are like, hey, he's going a little long. Couldn't he have just selected like a smaller passage of scripture? People think that. Sometimes people say that if it was a very long sermon. But, but here we have the picture of before they were to, to even attempt this conquest, um, there's the idea of we need to make sure that we are solidified in God's law. It is important enough that we are going to read it out loud. So if anyone says, you know, I would read the Bible, but I'm not that good of a reader, it's not a good excuse. If anyone's like, man, I would read the Bible, I don't have enough time, that's not a good excuse. But it's important in God's Word that we submit to God's Word. We mm. cannot submit to God's Word if we don't bother reading God's Word. But if mm. you cannot read, I'm going to give you an out. If you absolutely cannot read, if you are illiterate, you are allowed to do what the Israelites did. You are allowed to listen to someone else read the entirety of God's Word. So that there's your one out. That's your one. <laughs> read through the entire Bible. If you can't, you are allowed to listen to someone else read it. <laughs> Boy, isn't that the truth? And, you know, it's, it's also amazing. Not only did... They have to uh, read the, the, the Word of God, the law. Mm -hmm. They also had to circumcise every uncircumcised yes. uh, male before they went into this. God, God requires obedience, mm -hmm. uh, period. Yes. Uh, there's no if ands, or buts about it. And, so, you know, uh, well, well, I'll say this too. If I'm, if I'm an Israelite in that day, and I'm about to go fight a series of a series of, of battles against opponents that just objectively are stronger than we are. Yeah, I'm going to be doing everything in my power to make sure that God is on my side. So we're not only just reading and listening to the law carefully, we're making uh, sure through extraordinary measures to make sure that every letter of the law was being obeyed. Because we want to make sure we don't do anything that's going to mess up the Lord's provision because we know without Him, we're not going to win. Mm. So uh, it, when God makes the command, mm -hmm. wipe them all out. And that's going to include women and children. Yep. Obedience to the Lord, period, is required. Mm. What's going on here? Who is this God that would ask this? Well, I think there's there's three different ways to, to understand it. Um, one is like that high theology uh, way of like here's some here's some deep explanations, um, and honestly that that's kind of a harder pill to swallow, especially if it's someone's first time through the Bible. Uh, another layer is just that well, let's just think through this on like a low level. Uh, theology of like, hey, this is just some truths that we can cling to that help paint that picture. And then the, the third level is, well, we can just go strictly pragmatic. Why is this actually a good command uh, for God to make to this nation? So uh, I'm going to start with that purely pragmatic and just kind of work my way up. So the pure pragmatic sense of why actually if we place this in its historical context, would this be a fair and just and reasonable command? Well, this is the ancient world. And in the ancient world, things are much more barbaric than they are now. And one of the common things for nations and cities to do is to go rape and pillage neighboring countries and cities and nations. And what they would do is they would not completely wipe people out. They would simply go into a town or city, kill all the people that would put up a fight, steal all the animals, all the, all the grains, all the gold, everything that they can, 
uh, burn some things to send a message, leave, come back a few years later, do it again. There were entire uh, nations that that is how they made their profit. That's how they supplied themselves. They didn't produce anything. They simply raped and pillaged the countryside. We even have a good picture of this in the story of, of Nineveh. Uh, that's the, the city that God once called Jonah to go witness to. That is a city that that's what they primarily did, uh, according to Scripture, in order to uh, to get their uh, in order to make their money. That's also what we see throughout the rest of the Old Testament of these neighboring kingdoms constantly going in and raiding Israel. So there's this idea that one of the ways that nations kept their power in those days was if you had a strong enough army, instead of producing, providing things for yourself, you would go kill, rape, and pillage the surrounding nations, and that is how you would gather your wealth. So in a very pragmatic sense, if God states this, if you are fighting this battle, everything is destroyed. That means that if I'm fighting this battle, the only motivation for it would be that this is an enemy that is in imminent danger to us, and we need to, we need to wipe them out. We're not doing it to gain wealth. We're not doing it to kidnap people as slaves. We're not doing it to, uh, to rape women. We're not doing it to steal money. The only reason, if everything's going to be destroyed, that you would be willing to risk your own life in the conquest of this would be because this is a threat. You need to eliminate that threat. And what you see is with these commands, once the, the conquering is over, Israel does not become a nation that is raiding and pillaging the neighboring surrounding nations. So on a very pragmatic level, if we place it in its historical context, what you see is, well, this is actually a command saying you are not allowed to have your economy be run on pillaging your neighbors, even though that's what everyone else seems to do. So that's that, that bottom level, very pragmatic the first time I heard that, I was like, that makes so much sense. Because mm -hmm. this is something that I really struggled with, of like, I don't understand why God was saying that either. That's that bottom level of pragmatic. Here's that second uh, level of like, let's get some theology. Let's get in some scripture into this. And this is, this is my go-to explanation. This is why I like to explain it. God had already described um, his terms for proclaiming judgment and destruction on cities and nations. And we see this with the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. God says that he is willing to wipe out completely uh, everyone in the city uh, if the city is completely filled with sinful people. And he has a conversation, and Jesus also makes an appearance in this story too. There's a conversation with Abraham of proclaiming, well, uh, how would God execute judgment on a city if there's righteous people living in there? And God makes it very clear he will not execute judgment on a city or a nation if there is a population of righteous people in that city. We also see the illustration of, well, what if uh, you have Lot and his family? Like, what, what if they're there? And God's like, I will literally send angels to rescue them and bring them out. I will not let them be destroyed by that same judgment. We see this also in the conquest era where God said everything's to be destroyed well, that means that we can conclude that these cities, if we believe in, in, if we believe in the Word of God, these cities are wholly evil, had rejected God because He has pronounced judgment on them. You say, well, what if there were, what if there was someone righteous in that city? Well, we have stories of righteous people in that city that God provides and protects and rescues from that city. Uh, Rahab is a great example of that. She actually is grafted into the line of Jesus. But even before we get to those specific examples as we get in the conquest era, before we even get to the conquest era, in the law, God gives instructions for how a foreigner can join the Israelite community. And so understand that during this conquest era, um, this isn't something where like it's a Tuesday and they travel 500 miles and they completely destroy a city because they got F-22 bombers and stuff. Like that's not how it works. You would slowly approach a city. 
you would completely surround it in a siege. Uh, that is how you would actually do that warfare. If you fought any battles on open ground, it would be one army of able fighting men versus another army of able fighting men. Uh, this idea that like you know there's bombs and missiles, none of that is around. And so if you lived in a city and you know that this army of the Lord, who is worshiping the same God that already pronounced judgment on Egypt, and you want to submit to God and join the Israelite community, you were allowed to do that. And there was plenty of time to make that decision and go. But if instead you chose to stay in the city and fight against the Lord's army and continue in your sinful ways, presumably because you know that if you were to join the Israelite community, you would no longer be allowed to do the sinful things that you're currently allowed to do. Well, at that point, you are actively fighting a war against God you should not be surprised when God wins that war. Uh, one last thing I want to touch on when we say that these cities are evil. Some of the things that were happening in those cities, just because sometimes we don't understand the context, you're talking about like child sacrifice is an incredibly common thing in those cities, in this region at that time. So don't think that everyone in these cities were just like really nice, cool, awesome people living their lives. Like active child sacrifice, worshiping these evil foreign gods, doing things that, you know, by every standard today is just absolutely despicable. That's what was going on. And God even says that if you don't wipe them out, um, those beliefs of all the people that did not want to repent and join the Israelite community, uh, their beliefs, their teachings, their influences will corrupt the nation of Israel. And we see that happening. And we see some of those pagan religions uh, last. And what did those religions do? Well, they would pass children through the fire. They would have child sacrifice. That is just one example of the kind of things that's going on. So we have that, again, that uh, very uh, pragmatic level. We have that mid-theology level. And then you have some real deep theology, which um, we can touch on a, a little bit. But there's so many books and so many great teachings really unpacking that idea. I, I'd recommend Augustine's Just War uh, if you really want to get into what it was one of the first examples of, of how God deals with warfare. Um, but I just want to reinforce uh, I just want to reassure everyone there are examples and there are explanations at every single level when you want to get to. But as you're reading the story, you got to place it in its context, and you have to remember God's overall plan for redemptive history. And you also have to be humble enough to say, you know what, if God is who he says he is, if he is creator, if he knows everything, if he is love, then I have to believe that uh, you know that he is not fragrantly uh, passing random judgment on people, and it's often the same crisis when you know people come to this and like, how could God do this? It, it's the same response they might have if if they have a family member that get, gets cancer. It's almost one of those things where like, well, why did God specifically cause this individual get to get cancer and not this one? And the truth is, sometimes you have to be humble enough to say, well, I don't know the specific reason for that specific person to get cancer, but here's the truth that I can cling to about God's character. So it's the same thing if there's a really specific question about a specific command on the specific city of why did God say that this had to be destroyed in this city at this time? Sometimes the honest answer from, from us ministers is we don't know exactly specifically why, but here are some truths that we can cling to. And if none of that made any sense, Joel's about to clarify and correct anything that I just messed up. <laughs> I don't have to clarify anything. Uh, I, I, I think it's, it's an interesting question to ask, and I like the way that, that you're breaking that down. What I want to do is just maybe add another, uh, another layer, mm -hmm. not, not, not changing anything that you said, but just adding mm -hmm. to it. And I think it's helpful also to look at that statement that God is love. Yeah. How do you harmonize the mm -hmm. two without just saying, well, God's love and I believe it and that's yeah. that. You know, God never 
requires faith that checks your brain out at the door. Yep. God does not work that way. And so I think it's interesting to look at God's mercy in this command. Yep. So you bring out Sodom and, and Gomorrah, and it is it is very true about God that he was unwilling to destroy the city mm-hmm. if there were even 10 that yep. were righteous in the city. So what does that tell us about the land of Canaan? Yep. Well, when Moses was on the mountain with with God, Moses said, Lord, sh- show me your glory. Mm-hmm. Show me who you are, the fullness. I want to know you completely. Mm-hmm. Show me your glory. And as the Lord passed by Moses, showing him what Moses could, could stand without dying instantly, yep. God said this, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, mm-hmm. slow to anger, yep. and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. Mm-hmm. What is God saying? There? This is, is one of the most confounding passages in all of Scripture. Mm-hmm. What does this mean? I think what, uh, what, what, what the Lord is doing is He is identifying to this generation of Hebrews and to Moses. Mm-hmm. I'm the one that brought judgment on the, on the world in Noah's day. I'm the one that brought judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah. I am slow to anger. I am love. I am merciful. I, I will keep my steadfast love for thousands, for those who, who, who believe me, mm-hmm. follow me, for those who submit to my terms for the covenant. But I will by no means clear the guilty. Yep. In other words, if you reject me, I will not clear you. And I will, I will do things like destroy the earth by flood. Hmm. I will do things like dis- display my wrath and destroy uh, Sodom and Gomorrah with fire and brimstone. Mm-hmm. And I will do things like destroy the people uh, of Canaan, the Canaanites who have yes. fully rejected me. And you read Leviticus chapter 18 and 20, and mm-hmm. where God is saying, don't do like the peoples around you. And, and I mean, like they, they are having sex with literally anything that moves. Mm-hmm. Their fathers, their mothers, their cousins, their sisters, their, their, their brothers, the, every animal mm-hmm. that, that it is possible for. They're doing it in, in, in homosexual ways. They're, like like they're, they are the most depraved people, and it's not like we have in today's culture, mm-hmm. in, in American culture, where, where the, the news and the media you know, makes it seem like everybody is just going crazy mm-hmm. in every area. Uh, there, there are a lot of people in America that are not doing those things. Yeah. Um, here you have the land of Canaan. You have them doing all of those things. Mm-hmm. The, the wickedness is astounding. But God says, this is who I am. If you reject me, I will not clear the guilty, mm-hmm. but I'm slow to anger. Now, you go all the way back to the patriarch era, the beginning yep. of the patriarch era, mm-hmm. and God calls Abraham to Canaan. What does Abraham start doing? His name was Abram at that point, but what does he start doing? He starts building altars mm-hmm. all throughout the land of Canaan. What is he doing? He's leaving a witness to the people of Canaan, yep. her creator God. Now, God tells uh, Abraham at some point that the sin of the Amorites is not yet complete, complete. right? Mm-hmm. And so what is God doing? He is, he is being slow to anger. And being sovereign, he's, he knows out ahead these, these Amorites, these, these Canaanites are not going to submit to him. Yep. But God is withholding his judgment for mm-hmm. a time. Um, but but God is leaving a witness to all. It's interesting, all throughout the story of Scripture, God never judges unjustly. He doesn't judge without 
a witness yeah. to himself. And so oftentimes he sends his servants before judgment ahead to give a testimony. Mm-hmm. We see it in Sodom and Gomorrah when the angels go into the city and spend the night. What are they doing? They wanted to spend the night in the square, in the city square. Why? I think God was sending them ahead as a witness yep. uh, uh, to him. But not only did Abraham build altars all over, but uh, Isaac uh, built wells mm-hmm. all over. Well, Abraham did too, yeah. but Isaac primarily built wells and named them after the character of God. Mm-hmm. Um, Jacob built a lot of pillars yeah. with names uh, that, that illustrated mm-hmm. or, or indicated the character of God. So the people of Canaan for for hundreds of years have had a witness to who Creator God is, yeah. and they have failed to submit to Him. Mm-hmm. So I think it's important to look at all that God has done in order to prevent this. Mm-hmm. Now, God has said, uh, you brought up Nineveh. God, God's message to Nineveh was that in three days I'm going to destroy you completely yeah. and utterly. That was God's pronouncement of judgment. What did those people do? They fasted, Mm -hmm. and God relented Mm -hmm. from what he said he was going to do. So I think it's important when we look at the land of Canaan, we say, who is this God who would command his his people, newly established nation, to go in and wipe them out? Well, he is slow to anger, but he will not clear the guilty. So there's so many examples in Scripture where God determines to execute judgment, but then He relents because people repent. And and, and we also see in in Canaan's story that God left them a witness hundreds of years before He actually executed. So what we can assume Mm -hmm. by the character of God that Scripture reveals is that no one in Canaan repented. But there was one. Mm-hmm. Her name was Rahab. Yes. And, of course, that story uh, actually is the f- most famous story out of the uh, conquest era. It's Joshua fought the Battle of Jericho. And the walls Joshua came fought the Battle of Jericho. Jericho and the walls Jer- came tumbling, tumbling down. down. Yeah. That's, that's literally the only thing I knew about the conquest era you know, until, just, until just, my uh, adult life. Well, maybe, maybe you and I should stop podcasting and just start a singing career. What do you say? Um, you know what? I know that you're a good singer. I'm not that good. I'm the kind of singer where if I get really into a song and I'm singing like in the car, uh, like my wife will reach over and turn the radio up to try and drown out my voice or, you know, it's a, it's a, it's workable. My children do that too. I make a joyful sound to the Lord, but no one else considers it joyful. No, no. My, my children do that too, because the, the most irritating thing in the world to me is when someone who is a singer goes around singing just like not on stage performing somewhere but just goes yep. around singing trying to sound good yeah and you're like you hear it and you're like who do they think they are so the rule is mm-hmm. whenever you sing just like in this setting right yeah. here you're not trying to sound good because if you sounded good then that would just be weird um you, you know what i'm saying okay so well just so you know that was my best attempt to sound as good as possible <laughs> i thought it sounded pretty good so rahab anyway right, right. so joshua the battle of jericho uh here's what i think is so amazing about that song and that story joshua didn't really fight the battle of jericho mm. uh, if we go through the the story of jericho what we understand is in in like this premier first major battle of the conquest era. Uh, God, in order to, to set the pattern, in order to let everyone in the region know that that God was the one behind the might of this army, uh, the Israelite army does almost nothing. Um, God commands them to do something incredibly odd. And really, it's also a test of Joshua because God gives Joshua this command, and then he has to tell the people to do this, and they have to trust Joshua enough to go with this crazy plan. Let me tell you about this crazy plan. I want to hear about this crazy you plan. You have the city of Jericho, okay? And it has really big, tall, thick walls. And there's little English peas on the top of it. Wait, what? <laughs> you haven't seen the VeggieTales episode? I have not. The I've guards, not the, 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 the uh, Jericho soldiers are English peas. 
I I need to I need to go yeah. watch. You know, as, oh, my, as my kids word. get older, we'll go back and we'll watch all the okay Jericho the Big City. I was big really walls. confused there. Yeah, Big yep. City, Big Walls. Um, so here's the thing about walls in, in the ancient world. We there were no explosives and there were no rockets and there were no helicopters. So if you have a really sturdy thick wall, it's very difficult to break that wall, which is why most uh, most armies in warfare, what they would do is they would lay siege to a city. They would completely surround the city, cut off supplies of food and, and water if possible, um, and basically just try to wait and starve out that city because that's the only real way you could conquer a city with walls. And so you see this happen as the Israelite army goes to conquer Jericho. They s- completely surround the city, and all the people in the city are thinking, okay, this is now a siege. This is a waiting game. Either the uh, invading army is going to run out of food and resources, or the people inside the city is going to run out of food and resources, and one of them is going to give in. That's how most siege battles were won. It's this long thing. But instead of um, trying to attack the city, instead of shooting things in, instead of trying to light things on fire, here's what the Israelite army uh, does according to God's instructions. They march around the city and they blow their trumpets. And they do this for six days. And then on the seventh day, they march around uh, if if memory serves me correctly, uh, seven times, yep. and blow the trumpet. And this time, here's what happens to the walls of Jericho. Um, the big, mighty, amazing walls. Well, they shout too. Yes, blow the trumpets and shout. So everyone. And the walls literally uh, come tumbling down. They they completely collapse in on themselves. The walls come tumbling down. down. So now the, the Israelite army is like, here's a city, and they have completely surrounded the city. And have it marching around. The walls fall and they all march directly into and attack the city from all points and are able to conquer the city of Jericho uh, incredibly quickly. Another point is, you know, Jericho's armies, where would they be? Well, they would be on the city walls ready to defend. And so when those walls fell, the soldiers fell too. And so there's this idea that this first battle uh, is a battle that God himself won. But there's a woman in this city named Rahab, and she has heard the stories of the God of Israel. She's heard about what's happened in Egypt. She's heard the testimony, and she knows, um, she knows that, that their God is the true God. And so there's no doubt in her mind that the Israelite army, even though they haven't conquered the rest of the region yet, they haven't won these big, mighty battles. Their, their army is relatively small, and the walls of Jericho are relatively secure. But she still believes that Israel's army, the Lord's army, is going to win. And so uh, she talks with some of the Israelite spies in the city and basically asks to be a part of the Israelite nation. Like, essentially, so like, yeah. I want to be adopted. She, into she gives a statement of faith of, of yeah. creator God. Yeah. And so what happens? How does God react to this woman and her family, because her whole household too, um, in this destruction? Well, uh, all the Israelites are given very strict instructions. Do not harm a hair on her head or her household's head. And they are saved, and they are able to join the Israelite nation. And she actually, Rahab, this prostitute from the city, ends up being a uh, a part of the line of Jesus Christ. And so if you're ever wondering, like, what what did God do, again, with individuals of faith in these cities who wanted to follow God? Well, he let them. And we have, right at the beginning, this, uh, this patterned story uh, that tells us this is how God is going to deal with these individuals. This is how God is going to interact in this way. And to really show that she was a full part of the nation of Israel, she wasn't a second-class citizen, uh, God chose to have the seed of promise, the line of Jesus, go through her line as well. And that is an amazing uh, story. It is, and, and it just speaks to the the mercy of God in the midst of this command to wipe out these people. Yep. It's it's important for us to, to recognize that, that God strives with the sin of men for an incredibly long time. Mm-hmm. You look how difficult things are right now in the world. Yep. It, it, 
it, it's despicable mm. where we are as an American culture, where, where other countries are, mm-hmm. in, where the world is and our capacity not just to sin, mm-hmm. but to tolerate sin. Yep. And, and yet God has not destroyed us yet. Jesus has not returned yep. to destroy the heavens and the earth yet. Mm. And it, it, it's important when we read these parts of Scripture and those questions come up like, man, this doesn't jive with my definition of love. If yep. God is love, why would He? People do this when they get sick, when they, they hear the word cancer, mm-hmm. when a loved one dies, when they lose their job. Why would God do this to me? Why would God allow this to happen? What's happening is, in that scenario, they've, they've believed a lie about God. Mm-hmm. So when you read this part of Scripture, it's just so important that... Um, you just remember the character of God, and that's mm-hmm. really the the power of the CBT fourteen hour framework. Yeah. That you know we don't read the character of God in in lists and remember that list and are able to apply that list. Here's mm-hmm. here's what a a theology book. Uh, you know I love it when you know when you talk about deep theology or mm-hmm. high theology. Here's here's what will happen if you read a high or deep theology mm-hmm. book on God. You'll see God is love. God is just. God is merciful. How in the world can you apply that though when you get to a story where God yeah. says wipe out all the women and children? of this Canaanite yep. land. Now, you have to understand the Bible as a story, and you have to be able to make connections like Jake made to Sodom yep. and Gomorrah. You have to be able to understand the story, be able to connect back to uh, the, the, the altars and the wells and the pillars that yep. were being built. All the, <laughs> the whole nation of Egypt was, became the most powerful nation on earth. And, and, and Joseph, a Hebrew, was, mm. you know, was the reason for that, who believed in Creator God and yep. proclaimed Him and declared Him. So you had this woman, Rahab, who was a, a prostitute. And Stan May always points this out. Prostitution is not a, an old woman's game. Mm-hmm. Okay? So I don't want to be crass, but that, yep. it's not an old woman's game. Well, the, the, the people of Israel have been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years after all of the mighty things God did in yep. Egypt. So it's been a period of 40 years. Now, either, either Rahab was old enough to hear the firsthand stories of what happened in Egypt. So maybe she was 10, let's say, or 11 or 12, yep. right? Mm-hmm. So then you fast forward 40 years and she's 52, Mm-hmm. As a prostitute, eh, unlikely. Yep. Here's what's more likely. What's more likely is, is the, the, the city of Jericho is, has been so terrified that they've been telling these stories for years, and Rahab's parents or grandparents told her about yep. these stories. Mm-hmm. What, is, what is more probable is that uh, she is not protecting all of her younger family members. Yeah. What's more probable is that she's protecting her mom and her dad and her brothers and sisters, yep. possibly her grandparents. Mm-hmm. That this is a, a younger woman yep. who has heard secondhand stories. This, man, this, this encourages us to such an extent to know that in the midst of God's wrath mm-hmm. against a people, any person can choose to repent. And so this story is not of an unjust God. Mm. This is a story of a God who is so loving. And he says, even though my intention is to kill every person, to destroy every person who Mm. rejects me, I will relent if they just repent. That's all he asks for us, Mm. all he asks us to do. And, you know, uh, speaking of just the the depravity uh, of these individual cities, uh, a depravity that God spoke judgment on 400 years ago uh, when speaking to, to Abraham. And that reference, by the way, is uh, Genesis 15, 16, uh, just in case you're, you're wondering where we, uh, where we got that from. Um, what we see after the conquest era, as we enter the judges era, is we see that they didn't fully finish the conquest of the Holy Land, and they weren't fully obedient to all the Lord's commands. 
And so these pagan beliefs um, end up creeping into that Israelite uh, mindset and nation and religious system. And you see throughout the Judges era, um, Israelite go from a fairly faithful nation, you know, for like the first year <laughs> when they first get there. But, but you see them go through this cycle of depravity and sin just abounding more and more and more. And it is exactly what God warned them about during the conquest era. And it's what he told them not to let happen during the conquest era. And at the end of the conquest era, we have one of the most famous pieces of scripture where uh, Joshua says, uh, choose you this day whom you will serve, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And if you've ever been to Hobby Lobby, uh, you have seen <laughs> an entire section of signs that you can put in your house with that verse. That's it's one of the most famous uh, pieces of scripture. Uh, but, you know, as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. And it it's always, uh, it's always taught kind of as this really uh, encouraging, uh, abundant, like, yeah, yeah, that's what we're going to do. But if you read the whole speech by Joshua and you read the context, what he's saying, he's looking, uh, now an older man, uh, you know, well, he wasn't that young when he started the conquest, but an older man, he's looking around. And he's, he's, he's really old Yeah, now. he's really old. He's, 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 he's probably at least 90, yeah. Yeah, assuming he was the same age as Caleb. Yeah. I mean, he's yes, he's an old, old man, so he's the head of his household now. Um, and he's, he's looking around, and he's already seeing uh, corruption, and he's already seeing uh, these pagan beliefs creep in, and he's already seeing people forsake the word of God. And so he gathers all, all the leaders before they go to their inheritance, and he says, listen, like, full disclosure, you need to decide if you're going to follow God or not. You, you need to make that decision because you can't halfway do it. And he literally says you can either serve the gods of your fathers, the gods yep. of, of the Canaanites, the Amorites, yep. or serve God, but you've got to choose. Yep. You can't, you can't do it halfway. You can't have a, you have to choose what you're going to do. And then he makes proclamation, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. But it is not an encouraging speech. It is a, it is a rebuke of the Israelite people saying like, this is the path of saying, repent now, choose this day to start serving the Lord. Yeah. And they decide to, to take him up on that challenge and yep. they, they, they give at least lip service, but it's more than lip service because they put away their idols. They do. They put away their idols. And like we see throughout Scripture, they put away their idols for a time. And you have a generation that is being obedient to the Lord for a time. But every generation that follows, uh, as we enter into the Judges era, we see that sin creep and we see the level of corruption increase. And I think it is just a good testimony to know that even here in America— or, or wherever you are, whatever country you live in listening, the truth is societies over time tend to become more corrupt and sinful until the people of God stand up and say, enough, we need to go back to God. We need to choose to obey him and repent. And so what you'll see throughout all of history is societies and countries go through stagnation and sin and then go through some kind of revival and repentance where we try to get back to the Word of God. And, and you see that pattern over and over and over. And I believe, specifically in America, we're at that point today now where, where we just got to decide as a nation, choose, choose to say, who are we going to serve? Um, are we going to have a revival and get back to the truth of God's Word? Or are we as a nation going to continue to slip into sin and depravity and therefore welcome judgment from God? Um, one of those two. You can't have it both ways. I'm hoping that through CBT, uh, we end up having a revival brought on by a renewed love and obedience to God's Word. Um, and, you know, I just would love to be a part of that kind of movement. Amen. I believe we are a part of that. And even if it doesn't primarily happen through the CBT world, I believe God is at work. I believe that you see evidence all, all across the board, even talking to Dr. Sandra Richter, uh, you know, just that people are putting together the story of God's Word. They're, they're applying frameworks to Scripture, which is uh, going to uh, allow uh, the local church 
uh, yeah. to, to stop throwing God's word behind their backs in exchange for, uh, you know, palatability uh, to seeker uh, yeah. and, and, and really, really minister and, and grow and mature the, the flock. Mm-hmm. Um, a, cool, a couple of cool things about the, the conquest era before we conclude. Mm-hmm. You have the the taking of of the country, as you pointed out. They didn't they didn't wipe out everyone like God commanded. There's there's some nuance there that, that God God actually God actually commanded them to to little by little in some areas. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, not to wipe every single person out at once mm-hmm. because then the land wouldn't be able to they wouldn't be able to sustain. The land, mm-hmm. but not only do they take the land, but then they distribute the land according to to lot. And yeah. everyone, every tribe gets their own inheritance. Every mm-hmm. family gets their own inheritance, and that inheritance is very important to God as we move forward in the story. Every time God gives an inheritance, it is it is important to Him, and yeah. He defends that inheritance. And we'll see that play out. Across the the throughout the story, Ava has a great teaching and some good thoughts, and we'll have her on sometime and get her to share them about the land that was allotted to each tribe. Some of of the tribes' inheritance had a lot of, of resources like rivers. Um, yep. uh, others were next to trade routes or involved trade routes. Mm-hmm. Others didn't get very much at all and had to depend on, yeah. you know, their brothers. So she has a really neat teaching on that. But, uh, but, but as that inheritance is, is allotted, what we're talking about, Joshua, before they go to their inheritance, mm-hmm. Joshua says, before you go, you've yep. got to make a choice. I think it's a powerful lesson for us. If you and I... And if you're listening, if you agree with us, you want to see revival in our day. We know that a prayer for revival is a commitment to act. We must commit ourselves to Bible literacy. We must know the story, Mm -hmm. discover it, understand it, become an expert communicator of it, and share it with others. And so, you know... Before they go to their inheritance, Joshua says, make this choice now. Don't, mm-hmm. don't try to make it you know, later in real time. I, I think we, we need to choose that we are going to know this book. Yep. The, 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 we're going to know God as he reveals himself through the story because we are commanded to share the gospel with every person everywhere. Yep. And, and that is how we are going to experience revival. Um, and you know, just to just to close out uh, our time, I'm about to do something that we haven't done before, but I'm going to do oh a shameless plug-in. Um, so we at CBT we are a nonprofit organization, and we're trying to bring the podcast and videos out on as many platforms for free as possible on on Facebook, on on YouTube, on Anchor and Spotify and uh, Apple Podcasts and all those things, and all those platforms. Um, if you want to get reach, if you want it to be exposed to a lot of audience, you have to pay those platforms money. We, we don't pay those platforms money. We're, we're a nonprofit. So no matter what uh, platform you're listening on or watching on right now, if you would like, subscribe, share, comment, absolutely anything that you can do really does help us just get this podcast get this message out to more people because the truth is like if if it's a facebook post if there aren't comments and shares facebook won't show it to a lot of people and and they won't know about it if we're on youtube if you don't subscribe and like youtube will not recommend it uh to other people when even if they're searching like if they type in cbt talks and search for it Uh, same thing with uh with podcasts when people are searching it is defined by how many listeners subscribers and people and and we really, because we're a nonprofit, we don't want to take um, the little bit of money that God has given us stewardship over and give it to these big corporations in order to advertise. We really want to stay grassroots. We really want just people sharing it uh, with other people. So if you could do that, that would help us out tremendously. But that is this it, 
uh, that is it for this episode of CBD Talks. I'm Jake. I'm Joel. Have a good day.